know, the, the problem is, I mean, the scale of these things now are, are huge. And so, of course, they're very expensive. And this gets back to, you know, the issue we talked about right at the beginning of this is um, what is the value, you know, what, what value does society place on these things that um, are, as Sama said, not necessary for survival, but they are, you know, intrinsic to our need to understand and our curiosity. And, uh, um, you know, that's something we as a society have to evaluate. Well, that's an interesting question. How much money, do you know how much money has been dumped into the Large Hadron Collider to date or into CERN and who, who pays for all that? So, I mean, I think the, the, the construction of the Large Hadron Collider was, I, I think they say about $10 billion. Uh, to, you know, to get it to the point of finding the Higgs boson. Um, it's a consortium. So CERN, which is the consortium of, of uh, countries, was actually uh, an outgrowth of UNESCO. So it was created shortly after uh, the end of World War II. And it was a consortium of European countries that the idea was to unite these countries who often who had been very recently uh, enemies into the peaceful pursuit of science. The idea is that science um, could be this unifying, uh, this unifying endeavor. That you know, there's a truth to science that uh, would transcend political differences and opinions and things like that. And uh, and so uh, there are these founding you know members of CERN and they each contribute money based on their size. And so that's where a lot of the money comes from. And then there are other affiliate uh, countries and institutions that contribute money for the privilege to be able to work on these experiments. Because, you know, essentially if you want to, uh, if you want to be at the forefront of understanding uh, particle physics, you need to be, you know, participating at CERN. And so other countries like the U.S., the U.S. is a huge contributor. Are They're they not, really? Yeah. Oh, I, was yeah. Just gonna, I was going to ask you, how much of this money does the U.S., how much input does the U.S. have like financially into this? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much, but it's, I mean, it's probably at least, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, again, I'm not sure. I'd say an order of magnitude of 200 million or something like that. Mm. So it's not, in, it's not, in, it's not inconsiderable. Um, and so what happens is it usually, it can come from, uh, it can come from the U S government, but often also from universities. So universities that want to participate, they want to send their, their um, students there, then they contribute and they get affiliated with one of the experiments. So whether, you know, whether it's Atlas or CMS or LACB, um, um, they um, contribute a certain amount of uh, money, you know, for their students to, to go and to work there. And uh, so that's what you saw in the film um, is that um, Monica, the, the graduate mm -hmm. student, Monica, uh, she was formally, I think at that point, she changed. She was at University of Pennsylvania. Then she was at University of Chicago. She was formerly a University of Chicago student. She was living at CERN, working at CERN full time. But, um, you know, it was the University of Chicago collaboration that was working on Atlas. Um, and um, they, you know, contribute a certain amount of money to do that. And they build things, they work on it. So they work on the detectors. So CERN itself is really, I think, I, I believe really supported by the um, members, you know, so that's the ring, you know, that's permanent staff, you know, um, uh, uh, I think there's 1500 or so people that are permanent there that are part of CERN. The experiments are really, they're, they're independent things. They are, uh, and they're supported by the institutions that participate in it. So all the universities that work on Atlas or Alice or LACB or CMS, um, they are independent organizations, groups of universities that come together. Yeah, we want to work on this together and we're going to have, uh, we're going to put this much money into the experiments. So uh, the funding for the experiments is a little different from the funding of the ring that they may, may, may maintain the, the ring.
The interesting thing to me about all of this, I think the most interesting thing to me is that, you know, there's so much that goes into this massive, massive undertaking of the, the LHC and all the experiments that go on. And it's, it's a very difficult thing for a normal everyday civilian to wrap their mind around. Right. Um, you know, normally if someone explains this to somebody who's never heard about it, you say, well, what's the point? What's the goal? What's the goal of all this? But what I've realized is that no matter what the goal is, the coolest thing is that all the things that you can discover on the way to that goal, like for example, the World Wide web, mm -hmm. like all the different innovations that come along in the process of trying to reach some peak, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or some summit of some, like some big discovery, some aha discovery mm -hmm. is that the, the, the interesting things that are innovated or discovered or learned about on the, you know, during the process. Yeah. I, well, I think that is exactly the point, you know, and again, it relates to this question that we brought up right at the head that, that, that Savas encapsulates and other people is that, um, um, you know, the people that do this for the most part, don't do it because they want to um, make a better mousetrap, you know, they're doing it because we want to understand, but the offshoot of that is, um, unpredictable and uh, immeasurable. And it has resulted in so many other things. Um, as I say already, I mean, from the LHC, I mean, the advances that we've gotten in understanding, you know, um, how to work with super cool temperature things, materials sciences, uh, optics things, um, magnetic, uh, ma magnetic phenomena, information processing, um, uh, you know, the web, um, yeah, I mean, you know, even even just at the, the the simplest level of information. I remember um, a number of years ago. Um, you know, we, we obviously are having an information explode. We have we're living in an age of information explosion, and um, my uh, a, a cousin of mine was working in uh, the field of uh, bioinformation and you know, in particular, dealing with all the genetic sequencing and our understanding of genes and. You know, uh, this used to be, it used to be very hard and expensive, um, but it was changing where now the cost of, um, you know, sequencing DNA was getting, you know, less and less and easier and easier. And suddenly people in biology were being, you know, faced with an enormous amount of data. And um, they didn't know, you know, how do you deal with this? And so they decided they need to see seek out the advice of the people that deal with the most data of all, and it's the people at CERN. And so they went to them and talked to them. And so one of the things that, that you know, was interesting, he has said at that time, is that at CERN, the amount of data created at the LHC, you know, the, the trillions and trillions of collisions every second, there's, it's impossible for us to uh, imagine. We can't, we can't deal with it. Okay, it's happening too quick for our computers. We can't possibly store it all. And so the first stage in after the collision is that it goes through an analysis, it's, it's called the trigger, and it immediately uh, throws away a huge amount of data, which is uh, things that they already know about and are not interesting. And so it, it filters out at the very first stage, a lot of uninteresting things that were not needed. There's a lot of junk, a lot of things that aren't interesting. Wow. And um, because I, they just can't even deal with anything else. So this is a very, you know, and of course it's a very tricky thing because you're throwing away data. And, but there's no alternative. We just couldn't deal with it. And what my cousin had said is at that point, he said biology wasn't at that uh, point where they could imagine throwing away data, but they were going to have to get to that point, you know, because there was, and so how to do that intelligently is something, again, it's not something you would even expect necessarily would uh, be a result of the, uh, you know, physics, but it's part of it. And um, it's one of the things that has been an outgrowth of, of this, you know, you're pushing the frontiers of understanding in science and technology and, that that does eventually have, uh, you know, it can have a certain unexpected benefit. Mm -hmm.